Okay, this is the, I'm Craig Rennebohm, and this is the Cherish the Children, Cherish the Parents Care for the Children workshop. I think I've done my official business, and we can proceed. Uh, there may be one or two others joining us, and we left the door open, but um, feel free as we go along to ask questions. Uh, I was saying to some of you, this is really the first time that we've publicly presented this set of resources. So it's, it, I mean, I helped put them together, working with uh, a group of colleagues in St. Louis. Uh, these resources have been designed specifically uh, to help these folks, these colleagues in St. Louis, uh, go out into local congregations and help them develop their mental health ministry with children and families. So what I what I want to start with uh, this is the the pamphlet or the uh, printout the handout that you have uh, is not the complete notebook. Uh, I pulled about a third of the resources that are in the notebook, and uh, I'll explain at the end. But but mental health. Uh, Pathways to Promise will have uh, have uh, this notebook available. You can either just email us and we can send you the notebook as an attachment and you can print it out. Uh, and I, I can't promise how long it will be, but we'll eventually also have the notebook up on the website for Pathways to Promise and you can just download it yourselves. So it's, this is not something that uh, is going to be real costly. Uh, if we send it to you as an attachment, you can just use it. If you want want Pathways to Promise to print out the full notebook and send it to you. There will be a small fee for mailing and handling. Uh, but what I wanted to do at the beginning is just quickly take you through the sample pages so that you, you and I'll just be kind of going through this, but, but using the, the easel and, and uh, newsprint uh, as a kind of framework for, for actually doing the workshop. But it, with this in hand, uh, the first page is really just a, a letter to the readers of the notebook. And I just want to stress that the notebook is designed to help you and your congregation develop spiritual care with children and families facing mental health issues. So that's the purpose of, of the notebook. It's here to help pastors. It's here to help lay leaders or pastoral staff. It's here to help uh, individuals in the congregation who want to take some leadership on mental health issues with children and families. And it's a guide, it's a set of resources so that a local congregation can begin to develop in addition to their regular youth work and Sunday school and other ministries with families and children begin to develop a particular sensitivity to the mental health issues that come up in, in, with children in our families. The table of contents, there's actually about 45 pages of material. It's divided into two sections. Section one is some theoretical material uh, that can be some background material on spiritual care and mental health, on working with children and families and mental health issues uh, and on some of the, the basics of children's development and mental health. So there's some resources to give you some kind of background. There's also some background on how to organize uh, a children's mental health ministry in your local congregation in that first section. And we'll talk more about that. But, but this, the idea is that you might eventually have a mental health team, but you don't need a mental health team like you'd have a health team or a, a social action team or whatever. But, it, but at least you can identify someone in the congregation who would be a children and family mental health guide. You can find one or two people in your congregation who from personal experience or background can kind of take leadership in this area. That You don't need a big organization to start. Just one or two people working together can, can begin a, uh, an emphasis on children's mental health ministry in the, in the congregation. Uh, and the basic way we can be 
supportive of children and families who are facing a mental health issue is to companion them. And we'll talk more about what companioning someone with a mental health issue is all about. This is not a highly trained uh, uh, professional uh, set of skills. It's something basic that any of us, all of us, can do with someone who's going through a difficult and challenging patch uh, or life struggle. Um, also in the first section you'll see that there's a real emphasis that on how important relationships are in our mental health starting when we're infants uh, our brains develop through the relationships we have with each other if, you, if I get born and you set me in a black dark windowless room and feed me a few of my capacities in terms of my brain will develop but not much my brain our brains really take being in relationship with each other to come to our full capacity so that's the, that's the basic sort of theory right that we're created we are created for connections with each other and our health our physical health our mental health our spiritual health depends on and is supported by the relationships we have with each other and with God. The second section of the notebook contains sample resource pieces and the basic notion of the, 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 the notebook is that to provide people with some basic resources at every point along the development journey. So there's some sample resources for a person to talk with uh, a young couple. Maybe not even married, but contemplating marriage or perhaps going to have a kid or have a child they didn't expect. But we begin with educating potential parents. That's how far back this goes. We don't wait till parents suddenly have the package and are starting to parent or care give. We want to try and move back and do some education early on. Uh, there are sample materials uh, for helping uh, the parents, caregivers of uh, newborns and infants. Second, uh, third set of materials to help uh, parent caregivers uh, of children who are in early childhood, uh, up until age five, uh, maybe going to kindergarten, first grade. Another set of materials, resources for parent caregivers uh, who have children in elementary school. And then a set of uh, resources uh, to share with parent caregivers of uh, adolescents, of youth going into middle school, junior high school, high school. So the basic idea here is twofold. One, let's work with the parents and caregivers, help them understand their vital role in developing and supporting the health and well-being of their children. And then secondly, let's provide resources to the parent caregivers uh, that are appropriate to the stage in life they're, they're working on with their young people. So that's the basic overview of, of, of the notebook. So what I'm going to do now is, is kind of take you through, if you want to follow the pages, uh, feel free, but the, the first page I'm going to... Uh, won't even refer to it. I just want to say a word again. This is a notebook helping us develop our capacity to offer spiritual care and support with children and families who are facing mental health issues. But it, it's a proactive approach. It starts not by waiting until a family comes to us and says, I don't know what's going on with my son or daughter or we just can't handle anymore what this notebook does is say all of us are going to probably face some challenges in our parenting and caregiving so uh, if, if, if you don't face any challenges uh, mental health wise with uh, being a parent caregiver or a child uh, that's a blessing but it isn't uh, there, we'll all face some questions probably somewhere along I was like 
chaplain in my first parish for the juvenile court. And one of the things I found myself saying was, I don't know a family in the world, including my own, that hasn't benefited from some help and counsel support at some point or other in, in, in the journey. So that's the philosophy behind this. And it's really a notebook of resources, and it's, it's not, I, we did not get this handed down on stone tablets. You can adapt this, and you can add stuff to the notebook or change things. That's what it's there for. It's a starter. It's not the end-all and be-all. Uh, as I said, section one uh, th- is some background material. And one of the things I want to stress is that just as we care for persons who are struggling with uh, uh, an illness uh, of the stomach uh, or uh, struggling with relationships, mental health is a spiritual concern. There's always a spiritual dimension to any kind of suffering and struggling we're going through. So we, we, we don't want to ignore huge areas of suffering and struggle in our communities, including the area of, of mental health. We want to encourage our congregations to develop mental health teams. Uh, you heard Alan talk about the mental health network uh, developing resources for working with the mental health issues of aging, dementia, uh, mental health resources uh, addressing uh, addictions and substance use disorders, resources for spiritual care with persons and families facing serious and persistent mental illness. Uh, trauma and PTSD, and children and, uh, and families. So an ideal would be if we had in all of our congregations a mental health team as part of the overall uh, disabilities inclusion team so that we were had folks who could help address some of these key issues. Um, we've conceived of the mental health team in a local congregation as made up of guides. And a guide is not someone who is highly trained with a PhD in social work or psychiatry. A guide for mental health purposes in our local congregations is someone who has personal experience or background in the area. So a children and families guide might be someone who uh, has had their own child and said, I, I want to share what I've learned with, with others. Or it may be a school teacher who interacted with school psychologists and uh, the special ed people and is not particularly trained in mental health issues, but knows that folks struggle with these and that there are people in the community or in various systems that can help. Uh, it may be someone who's specially trained. If you are someone who is specially trained in, in mental health issues or children's mental health, uh, if you're the children's guide, that's what you do. You're, you're the guide, you're not the therapist. Mental health team members in a congregation don't become, uh, they're not therapists, they're not, they don't make referrals, they don't do evaluations. That's, we do that in our private practice or in our, our, our settings out in the community. But the mental health team or the children's person is not somebody who's going to assess and evaluate. It's not somebody who's going to refer and it's certainly not somebody who themselves are going to offer treatment or therapy or counseling. The role of the guide is to take your personal experience and background and be a contact. So my pastor Craig and family comes to me and says, you know, uh, we went to, our child went to a screening and they said uh, that he's on the autism spectrum disorder and and they're wanting him to go to to some further evaluation and, and we're supposed to see the school psychologist and Pastor Craig, this is new to me, (laughs) but we have a children's and family guide who has some experience in this area, uh, as much or more than I do as pastor, and so I'd like to just put you in touch uh, with uh, Jim Peters or Joanne Summers and have you just talk informally. They kind of know some of this better than I do as pastor. Can you imagine, I know there are several pastors here, what it would be like if you had a, a children and families guide who's 
got some personal experience or background with these various systems and services and could sit down with a family and say, yeah, I have some idea what you're struggling with. If I don't know it, I can I know where the information is that may be helpful to you and I can help you begin to plug into resources. So that's a first rule. A second rule is just to say, I'm not an expert in this as a children's and family guide or some of the other people on the team, but we can sure check in with you on a regular basis. Uh, I'm here on Sunday. I'll see you during the coffee hour or give you a call during the week and, and just know that you've got somebody who will, from the, from the congregation, from the church, who will be open to sharing this journey with you. Not, you know, we're not going to do, you know, treatment and care, but, but we can provide spiritual support and companionship as you go through this journey. And then thirdly, the Children and Family Guide would say, uh, this is going to be someone we can call on to help develop education in the church, uh, to make sure that we're welcoming of families that come and maybe come with an issue or concern in their life, help build the commitment in the church to being a welcoming congregation, uh, maybe to develop some support groups for families, uh, maybe to figure out with the Sunday school program if there's a, uh, a child who needs some particular special attention in the in the school program or what we do in worship uh, when there's a, a young person who may need some particular attention or care rather than everybody going ah, worship is interrupted we would be like Jesus and say oh come on <laughs> we'll, we'll work with this this is a teachable moment this is a moment of faith and not just the pastor having to do it but have somebody in the congregation who say, yeah, this is part of human life, folks. This is part of what it means for us to be a caring congregation. In fact, rather than seeing these as problems, this is part of our core life as a community of healing and growth. Okay. I can fully appreciate the need for the fly having struggled with every book. And that's not taught in seminary, by the way. No. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is anytime you call it mental health, there's a negative connotation that's read into it. Even when we say mental wellness, there's still the stigmatism that, well, I don't want to go there because some people think we're having problems. How do you get around that to teach this vital lesson to the church community? I remember a, a very enthusiastic associate minister who led a class on parenting and chose one of her best friends. And having been on conference staff, I knew her growing up. I said, Rather than use her as a resource person, she has three-year-olds. I want us to talk to her mother who raised her. There's a difference. Right. And now, I look at, by the time you need it, like the death of a child, and unfortunately, yeah, I... You and I both, it. right. With my wife, we were so concerned with 90% of couples get divorced. How do we prevent this? And we, then we forgot about our kid. You know, there's so much to know beforehand. So I thank you for your, you know. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm tempted to try and answer the question about how do we do this right now, but I, I want to invite you to say, you know, as we go through the next hour together, I hope bits and pieces of how to do this will make some sense. I don't think there's one magic step. Uh, but I but I hope there's enough here to, that we can begin to see how a congregation can be begin to develop an approach that addresses these issues and begins to take the sting and the stigma out of using basic words like mental health. Uh, I mean, I, I've struggled for you. I've, I've, I've written a book and my, my agent said, don't talk about mental illness, talk about emotional well-being. And I thought, well, okay. 
But I'm not talking about emotional well-being. I'm talking about people who are suffering from a real powerful and brain disorder. And so part of what I've, I've tried to say in, in all of this is how do, how do we gently begin to take some of these very difficult topics and introduce them thoughtfully and tenderly into the life of the congregation. Uh, I, I wish there was some way around it, but I've come to the conclusion that stigma is stigma and you kind of have to begin to hit it, <laughs> not straight on, but, but you have to embrace it and recognize that you're going to be challenged. There will be people who say, no way. There will be pastors who say, I don't want any kind of mental health ministry in my church. But the, and it's interesting, well, why not? <laughs> Part of what you may begin to uncover is that they don't want to have to relate to, as with any other disability. They they would just prefer the church be, you know, this nice, happy place where everybody comes and there are no problems. Yeah, find that church and we'll worship. Yeah, that's. I keep saying, you know, where is that congregation? I sure never got it. Um, but part of it has to do with the role of the guide doing education long before there's a crisis and helping create a capacity for welcome. All of this happens and then in that context of, of an emerging mental health ministry in the life of the church, some of the big issues, I think, when they come up are better addressed. But we've got to start pretty far back. I think the important thing about having those guys with experience, um, it, part of it is credibility and relatability. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A children's minister who's never married and doesn't have children, a lot of parents, if, if I say something about their relationship yeah. to their children, they're, they, I don't have any credibility with them. Right. Well, what would you know about it? So, yeah. Well, this is why a key is finding somebody in the congregation who has some authenticity, integrity, background. And also see it as a criticism coming from the board. Right, right. This is a real sharing of the journey together, not Pastor Craig up here. Oh, I don't think you're Yeah, right. yeah. And that's another issue. I mean, all, all of us are tentative enough about our, our parenting, caregiving uh-huh. skills. And this is not about, you know, setting some kind of ideal bar and trying to get everybody up to it. This is really about recognizing we're all in this together. It takes the village to raise the kids. And how can we help each other do that? And all of us, I love a phrase in the field called the good enough parent, the good enough caregiver. Well, if I can get just a good enough, that's that's great. So that's the context. Kelly. Well, I, you have this list of things they may view as, as guides, and I'm wondering if uh, partnering with parents attending IEP meetings might be a part of that, because I know with physical disabilities there's kind of Sometimes people will go with the parents to those meetings and having been a a mentor to youth with emotional disabilities Mm -hmm. in the schools and having been in meetings with schools and parents, it's it just seems like there's no one there for them there. Absolutely. I mean, it can be lonely wandering through the various systems and services that are there to provide some care and support for children and families, but it can be daunting to find your way. And so one of the practices of companionship is accompaniment. Can I just simply go with you and be there? Not as an expert on your behalf, but just simply as I would accompany you uh, to an appointment with, uh, with your doctor. Or I'll go with you to that meeting at the school where they're going to be talking about an individualized education plan. And by the way, we might want to borrow from some of that when we think about how to help Susan or Peter or or Adam in the school. So there's a a win-win. But you're absolutely right that accompanying that piece of companionship practice can be very helpful. I sure don't know if someone has been there. I'm sure you've talked to people 
people in the IEP, though, because to bring somebody in that they don't know uh, can be very daunting for the people in the IEP. I right. Have terrible problems with my granddaughter right now, who's severely disabled, and uh, they don't want her mother to come to school in this time of transition between medications for seizure. Mm -hmm. And she needs to be there to make sure, and the teacher is so daunted by anyone being in her classroom and observing her that uh, bringing a stranger in, she wanted me to go with her, and I'm her granddad, and there was still absolutely so make sure just make sure right. that, that well legally families have a right to bring advocates I know. with them yeah. to the and this is so you can notify them you're bringing someone sure. but you don't have to okay and, and yeah i know that I'm just... <laughs> this dialogue right here is what i would hope would go on not just in this national conference, but this dialogue would be uh, parents and, and children's family guide in the local congregation. You have an IP, EP, IEP, you're meeting with someone in the school about the plan for your... Uh, Jim, here's some, here's some things, maybe just a checklist of things to, to think about. And I'd be glad to go with you, but I want to make sure that you know... You know. Exactly. What if this wisdom were common knowledge at the local congregation level? That's what we're driving down to in this notebook. And thanks, Kelly, for the introduction to the practices of companionship. And I just want to run through these very quickly. The first practice of companionship, if I'm a children family guide or I'm a companion, uh, a child or family in the congregation, is hospitality, creating safe space. I mean, as I begin to get to know, do I just rush over and embrace Melanie? Well, maybe for some. Have I met you? Yeah. <laughs> but what we talk about in training for companionship is you, you kind of negotiate. You see what that space, what works. And it works differently for different children, for different adults, for different families. Uh, a second aspect of hospitality that we teach uh, in this is, is that an absolute fundamental respect for each person. Whatever the issues may be, this is a human being who is struggling with. This is a person who has difficulty with. And the person first. Above all, that's fundamental to our faith and theology. This is a person with divine worth and value. Now the secular world isn't going to necessarily think that way. And even in our spiritual <laughs> communities. We don't treat always everybody equally with that fundamental respect. But that's what hospitality is about, is living out that fundamental understanding that each of us is of worth, infinite worth and value. And then thirdly, if you want to be hospitable, there's nothing, you know, this is the best probably setting we've had for, for the welcome, widening the welcome kind of, they've been bringing snacks out since 7 o'clock this morning no accident that hospitality and food go together so how do we just get together with some safe space, respect for one another and maybe just sharing some refreshment, that's where that's a beginning point a second practice is neighboring and neighboring means that we're setting aside some of our power over in order to be with each other. So that neighboring means, rather than seeing what makes us different, neighboring talks about what do we have in common? So, you know, often a disability or a mental health issue, developmental disabilities, mark someone as visibly or perhaps invisibly different. And yeah, we do have our differences. But in neighboring, we begin with exploring what we have in common with each other. Uh, and we, we come together on even ground. The third aspect, and this even reinforces the, the first two, is that I can be, there are different ways we can be with each other. I can be in front of you, uh, I can say, come on, let's all go this way, I can lead. Or I can try and get behind you and push and say, you got to go that way. Um, I can stand in front of you and say, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> None of those are particularly helpful if you're struggling. 
But another way I can be is side by side with Don. And see how that immediately moves us back into more of that neighboring. And Don, what do you see up there? Easel. Easel. I was looking at the uh, iced tea because I was thirsty. <laughs> now who's right? Don looking at the easel or Craig looking at the... No, when you're side by side and you're looking out together, you're going to see different things. You're going to see things differently. That's what we expect. And so the, the practice of companionship is to share the journey side by side. Not Don, you have to do it this way. Not Don, you have to go there. Not Don, follow me. But Don, what do you see? What's going on? How do you... And what steps do you want to take? If I'm standing in front of you lecturing about you got to go through me to get wherever you're going. So companionship includes this practice of side by side. A fourth practice of companionship is listening. And I, I put up something that's, that I've, I'm drawing on more and more. Uh, a guy named Jürgen Habermas, who you, you don't need to read his stuff, it's in German and it's terrible to try and even begin to get a handle on. But one of the things he said is that every utterance is an invitation to a conversation. And I've thought about that over the years. I mean, it doesn't even have to be a vocal, a vocalization. we can be invited into companionship and into listening to one another even without words that's how we're made to be in relationship to connect with each other and one of the ways we connect is just to to gesture to utter and I'm thinking you know there are a number of us who have difficulty articulating if our companionship requires that you invite me in clear speech to say, Craig, will you come on and join me? I'm, there are a lot of folks I may not companion. But if I am alert to the utterances, to the gestures that people make, your day is going to be more than filled with enough people <laughs> to share the journey with. What would happen if more and more people in our congregations we're listening to each other, we're listening to the children with that sensitivity that a gesture, an utterance is an invitation to connect. But that's a practice, a key practice of companioning. And the fifth practice is what uh, Kelly and I were talking about, being open to going with someone on the journey, to go to an appointment together. Uh, and sometimes we can't go physically with each other, but we can hold one another in prayer thought. I'll give you an example. I was uh, uh, a chaplain on the psychiatric units at our county hospital, and at the end of the week, I'd been working with this woman day after day, all during the week, and then I said to her on Friday, I said, you know, I won't be visiting over the weekend. I don't, I'm not here. Oh, she said, chaplain, your visits have been so important. I'm like, Good. And uh, I was pleased. I was helpful. And then she said, well, couldn't you just come on Saturday? And I said, well, you know, I, I have, my children's got a soccer game and this and that. And I, said, I really can't. I'm not able to do that. And then she said, well, how about Sunday after church? Just come by for a few minutes. And I said, you know, no, I'm really not able to do that. And then I said to her, you know, wherever I am on Sunday, and it's usually at my home church or maybe I'm preaching, wherever I am, I will remember you in the prayers of the people. So, Sunday came, I was at my home church, prayers of the people, I just spoke up a little phrase, I want to remember someone who's in the hospital, our county hospital. That's all I said. Monday when I went in to see this woman, she came up with this incredible smile on her face. She said, you know, chaplain, all day Saturday I thought, tomorrow he's going to pray for me. <laughs> All Sunday morning, she said, I was thinking about, is this the time when he's praying for me? All Sunday afternoon, I thought, I was prayed for. I was more present with her through that few seconds of prayer than I think I would have if I'd made a grudging visit. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that we can accompany each other both physically, but we can also accompany each other spiritually. And what counts it's not how long or how much or you know, but that we're there, that we show up at some point. So if our
Children and Family Guide doesn't have to have a whole lot of experience, doesn't have to have a lot of contacts and information to share, but if we at least have someone who can practice this kind of companionship with family, and maybe draw some others into this ministry of companionship with children and families. What a huge gift that is. And we do it. We do it with families that are suffering bereavement. We do it with individuals and families who are going through cancer treatment. We go and visit regularly folks in the nursing home or who are homebound. This is nothing new. We companion people all the time. And members, you know, deacons, deaconesses, parish visitors, we all have programs. And part of what we're trying to say in the mental health ministry is the same thing we do with anybody else, we can do with those who struggle with a serious mental health issue. You know, one thing that strikes me, though, Craig, about the story you just told that is really powerful, was just an aha moment for me, is that all of these practices that you're talking about, you're talking about doing not as a gesture, but with your full being, really being a part of that and being present. Because the reason that worked with that woman in the hospital was because you didn't just say, I'll pray for you, but somewhere you had, you had established enough of a trusting relationship. Yeah. When you said you'd do it, she knew you would do it. It wasn't just an idle kind no, of... No, it wasn't I'm just... make you feel good kind of thing. You really right. meant it. She believed you'd follow through. And then it became an act of power for her. And that, that's really powerful. Well, and I think what you're pointing to is that any one of these practices alone isn't it. Yeah. It's, you know, we spent time negotiating and exploring some safe space together. She knew I respected her. I was honest with her about what I could do and couldn't do. You know, we, she knew that I wasn't there to try and be a power in her life and, and direct her some way and, and that we had explored some things in common. And I sat side by side with her in the room. I didn't confront her on stuff and I listened. And then when I made a gesture of accompaniment, in this case the offer to hold her in prayer, that was part of a whole journey of companionship. And I think that's, that, that's helpful. I hadn't quite put it that way either for myself or as a way you're putting it. But I also think this is exactly why Jesus was, I mean, part of what Jesus did. This is not a Craig Renable 101. This is, you know, this is what Jesus did for three years, day in and day out. All this kind of stuff. Uh, and a handful of people gathered to him <laughs> because you res- we respond when people are hospitable and neighboring and come along side by side and listen and, and share the journey with us. So, I, I, Kelly, go ahead. And this kind of justified mental health ministry as a hospice chaplain. That's all I do. Right. <laughs> That's what I yeah. do. And, and part of exactly, and, and it's interesting that both of you as pastors are kind of having some aha moments. Craig's not asking me to do something that's you know rare and different. This is what we do, and what we're what we're discovering is what we have done <laughs> is what we can also do with folks who are struggling with all sorts of other life conditions than simply physical illness issues, whether in the hospital or homebound. Steve. I'm still stuck on quote unquote you know, previous life I was in retailing. And so I still need to quote unquote sell something. Our Christian education board at church is not for Christian nurture. Mm-hmm. And how do you do a program under Christian nurture? That's my selling point. It's not we're gonna walk by you or what have you, we're going to help you help others. And there, I can bring more people into the program. Right. Because it's not about their problem. And you're, exactly, you're lifting up that most likely if something like this is going to work, we're probably going to be in touch with the, with the Christian Ed, Christian Nurture, uh, Children and Youth Program, whatever it is. And we can't go in and say, hey, here's, here are your problems and here's how we're going to help you solve them. It's more, how can we work together when some issues come up? I think I've noticed that even most of our churches, there is no grace. We say things like, sing with me, please be seated. 
we give permission rather than yeah. be inclusive. Little things like that, people subconsciously pick up. And, and changing that culture from permission giving to grace affirming is, is this is what this is part a big part of what this is all about yeah Melissa well, I mean I think you know presenting something like this to like, like our church or whatever it would be it's like first of all tapping into well we're talking about the other and the other is not us um so it's, you know, we're talking about bringing in, you know, 20 kids off the street or from some other church or community that are mentally ill or something, and that's not us. So, no, we're not going to do this. But, of course, that's not what we're talking about. And, and and so I think of my kids. I've got two special need kids, and they're not mentally ill, but they have special needs. And they're not physical special needs. They're not, you know, um, you know they're, they're not obvious, you know, whatever. Um, mm-hmm. They're not autistic, but you know they, they have special needs, and and one of them, my daughter, is very active. So um, she's been there since infancy. She's eight years old, and over the years, it's taken a very long time for the church to learn that yeah, okay, she's not going to join the circle at the end of the church to hold hands. She's not going to run up to the front of the church and the with lesson. the other kids, and then you know have the blessing, and then run out of the church to go to Sunday school. Be touched by people. I mean, you know, it's taken them a long time to figure that out. Years. They finally have got it. Um, They adore her. So, hearing this stuff, they go, oh, Olivia, duh, okay, (laughs) of course. I mean, they would, they would, you know, they would sell their cars to take care of Olivia. I mean, you know, she's there. I mean, she's the church. Um, my son is even yeah. in the church is there. Yeah. So if this was presented and they could hear Olivia's name or my son or any other kid, yeah. they'd go, Oh, okay. So we're not talking about mental illness, we're not talking about whatever, we're talking about loving our kids into being. We're talking about loving our kids into health. Yeah. Not here necessarily loving them into health. So the new kids that come to church kids in our church that grow up older and become, you know, have mental illness, which of course other people in the church have, and of course some of the adult children have, and of course the husbands and the wives and the whoever's have. Um, then it starts making some sense, and then it's all of a sudden not the other. It's like, oh! We're getting close. Because there are some pieces of the resources that really just say that. This is our overall approach to each other. This is our approach. This is our commitment to kids. All kids. (laughs) All children. And some of us have special issues, concerns, needs here. Others of us have special issues, needs, concerns over here. But we're all part of the family. And so this is just to tune us up as we discover that there may be areas of our life together where we haven't been as uh, as capable of loving each other as we might like to be. So it's not a, that, that's, you know, this is a very organic thing. It's not a matter of we're going to set up six lessons and it's, it's really, say, a first step would be, let's get together some folks perhaps who, uh, uh, parents who would like to talk about some of the difficulties and challenges and maybe one of those persons would be willing to kind of for the next year informally be uh, kind of a children's guide for if, if there's special needs or issues that come up and we'll start slowly, no big, you know, not a. This is not a big program. It's going to be a. It's going to be slowly building this in the life of the congregation. But I want to give you the overview. And I'm realizing as I give you the overview, it can sound like, gosh, we got to get to from A to Z uh, by you know next fall. And that's this is a very incremental, organic process. And the pieces of this. It doesn't fall together one, two, three, four. The pieces of this emerge over time, uh, and it develops in the life of the congregation. Um, Let me give you one suggestion, for instance. May is Mental Health Month. 
all over the country, various mental health organizations are putting out resources and, and there's stuff on the news and television. And the president makes an announcement and the governor and the mayor all celebrate May as Mental Health Month. Also during that time, uh, several groups have established what's called Children's Sabbath. And they put out a variety of materials for Children's Sabbath. We don't even have, all we, all we would need to do next year, if we did nothing else, was say, hmm, during May, Let's see what's, what the resources are for faith groups around Children's Sabbath and maybe draw on one or two of those for the liturgy on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, a second step we might take is as a congregation just to say, let's, let's develop some kind of covenant or pledge statement. There's a sample in here of our commitment to children. Maybe we would read that together on Children's Sabbath or at the time we install church school teachers or celebrate the youth group. But those are ways of beginning to start that, that don't necessarily say, we've got a mental health ministry with kids. We've got a ministry with children and families, and part of that is a sensitivity to the broad range of issues and concerns that families and children bring to the life of the congregation, and we're concerned about that broad range because we don't want to end up saying our ministry with children and families is for those who don't present any kind of real problems, <laughs> subtly or not so subtly. Uh, so our pledge says, and we will, you know, all children are of value and worth to us. On Children's Sabbath, we celebrate all of the children in our congregation. Uh, and we begin to name some of this diversity and range uh, as part of who we are. And we do it, you know, not as a big blast to say, you know, and, and over here is little Olivia, our, you know, <laughs> poster child for this, or, or little Johnny, where it's, it's, no, it's subtler than that. But I think the reality is that in all of our congregations, there are children and families who, who, you know, just as there are adults of us who have disabilities, struggles, that's who we are. And what we're trying to do in many different ways is to say, what does the church look like if we recognize that as, as part of the key characteristic of being God's people, the beloved community? That rather than excluding, our core life is about including. Uh, but it's a challenge. Uh, one of the things we talk about, it, and uh, some uh, handouts in the notebook on the importance of relationships, uh, a little article about cherishing the parents, the importance of the role of parents, uh, and, and then we talk about uh, caregiving with newborns. Just a little sort of a life goes on. It doesn't, you know, it isn't just about what you do now in the first few months or what you do at three. Caregiving for it's a lifetime process, and so St. John's by the gas station knows that nurturing and caring begins, you know, at the very earliest stages of life and continues uh, until death and beyond. <laughs> Nothing new. Well, so I want to draw your attention to the sample resources, and some of these are in the uh, uh, in the booklet, and. If you go to what's named here at page 26, there's a sample letter. Yes? Before you moved too far away from nurturing, Ben was telling me, okay. I wanted to say, I'm co chair of my church's disabilities quest. I was struggling with an issue, and all of a sudden, I found myself at the other end. I realized that I was benefiting from the ministry that I was on. Absolutely. The power of doing is what right. I wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> this is a mutual ministry in the end. This is not about somebody up here doing for somebody down here. It's about doing with and for each other. I appreciate that, Ben. That's the flavor of this. That's the side by side, not the kind of approach. Well, in terms of working with children and families, we begin with a, a letter, perhaps, or uh, if a couple comes in for premarital counseling, uh, to share with them. Just we know that there can be struggles with couples, and as you become parents or caregivers, we just want you to know that that, that if anything comes up, you can. We're here for you. I, I loved it at the White House conference. 
the most telling moment was when I saw President Obama look directly at the cameras that there were a room in the room, and he says, "You are not alone. We are here for you." And I, and I took that as a covenant that means all of us. It isn't that you know we're going to all rush up to the White House and try and drag President Obama to come take care. That is our task together down at the local community level. Uh, and it begins with how can we be there with young couples who are beginning to think about being parents and, and, and to say, you know, we don't know where this adventure is going to take us. We don't know exactly what will come up in your journey together. But we're prepared as a congregation to be with you whatever this journey brings. Uh, and then as, as, as a couple uh, or a, there's a child come into the world, and this is why we use parents caregivers because not everybody's got two parents, you know. Parents caregivers, if we know someone's going to be bringing a child with, through adoption or a pregnancy is coming to fruition uh, or not. You know. How are we there for our children and families at that point in the life uh, of a couple? And then as children are getting into preschool, begin to socialize more, another letter, and I, I use letter simply as a marker just to say, how is it that we reach out in an intentional way at these points of great change and growth in the life of the family? Rather than simply saying, you know, Johnny's moved from the, the pre-kindergarten class now to the first grade uh, program, as if that's all our, you know, that's all it's about, is getting Johnny through the hoops at church school like he gets through the hoops at big school. Uh, and then a letter, an overture, a reaching out to parents as, as, as uh, caregivers as their children move on into uh, you know, middle school and, uh, or elementary school and then middle school adolescence. And this is kind of a, a, just a, a marker to remind us that children and families go through some tremendous changes and growth and challenges. Uh, and so it's not about, you know, oh, we'll send you a letter if we figure out that you've got some mental health issues. We'll just simply be in touch with all our families. And if there are some issues that come up as we, one of the suggestions we're making is that in the fall each year, there be some potlucks for, you know, new parents. Potlucks for the preschool parents, caregivers. And invite the neighborhood. <laughs> Not because we want you to come to church on Sunday morning, but because we want to care not only for the members of our congregation in our neighborhood and community, but because we want to care for all the children. We have care for all the children in our neighborhood and community. So you can be part of St. John by the Gas Station's family and children ministry without being a member of the church. And you know what? Maybe some of those folks will realize, oh, that's what, this, that's what it means to be part of church. It's a community of people who care about each other, who love one another. Oh, okay. I'll come to coffee hour and join the church. Uh, I, have to, I wanted to share something that I did with my kids. When they graduated from high school, I sent them a letter thanking them, not just for their accomplishment, but for being such a loving person. And I added it. I added to this a, a frame poem that was shared by Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. Lord Child of God. Mm -hmm. And I started doing this as a youth minister with graduates in church. And I found out that it's a pretty cheap present. <laughs> yeah. and I could print everything on my own. Mm -hmm. I gave each person a rock. Yeah. Say, yeah. Like Christ, you are the cornerstone. And your choice of being a cornerstone, using this rock as a cornerstone, mm. or to throw at a glass house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's an affirmation over and over again at whatever stage. Right. And the proudest day of my life is when my kids said, I'm no longer your daughter. You're going to be known in the state legislature as my father. <laughs> she started testifying. Right, right. But I think some of that, as I look at parents, 
gets in the way at every stage. When they show anger, when they show negativity, it's not about loving the child, it's about disapproval of the child. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what, why the child is going through. When I hear terrible twos, my kids didn't have terrible twos. They were growth moments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I say terrible too, it's because they're not like me. But yeah. at two, right, two right, right. years of age, they're not going to be 40. They're yeah. not going to be 30. So uh, what I would cherish, if you were in my congregation, Steve, is that you would be part of some conversations with other parent caregivers over those important years. And you would have some wisdom to bring. Uh, Kelly would have some wisdom to bring. Uh, you know, Don would have some wisdom to bring. And we would... I have, There's no way I could get enough t learning and education and seminary to be the wise pastor f on everything that uh, parents and families face. I mean, that's nuts. But what I can do as a wise pastor is say there's a lot of wisdom uh, in the community and we can share with... It's, it's hard to learn. Yeah. Our pastors aren't taught that. Well... Because we have to perform. Yeah. <laughs> I can remember nights where I'm telling my kids, Hurry, we have to finish dinner because I have a youth meeting. Right, right. Duh. <laughs> well, part of what this curriculum is about is sort of turning things 180 degrees on that and saying that it, you know, church is not about the pastor and his or her expertise and wisdom and, and authority. Church is about how we can live and love each other together. <laughs> including families and any family in the congregation regardless of what the issues and challenges are that they face. That's, that's the fundamental message here. Uh, and these letters too are just a prompt to say let's not forget about our families and with these letters let's, let's find the rocks that we give. Let's, let's put together some stuff about anger. Let's, and that's what, what is in the notebook as well. Some samples of resources, things you can do. Um, and some of those we've taken, we haven't even invented this. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Georgetown University put together a curriculum uh, for pediatricians and pediatric nurses and social workers on, a, on resources that could be given to families who come in for checkups uh, in infancy, early childhood, middle childhood, and adolescent. Now, there are like close to 120 one to two page handouts that were developed, I mean, we don't have to invent all of this. I mean, your child is crying. All kids cry. Here's a one-page handout that I found enormously helpful. I wish I'd seen it when I kids were, you know, infants. Uh, I saw it a few years ago when I started thinking about this curriculum. A beautiful little one-page thing about crying. Uh, and so I think there are recent, well, all we've tried to do in the notebook is to say you can go to the Bright Futures website and you can download all kinds of one or two page handouts as a beginning point to share with, with, along with that letter. Uh, or you can find in your own community resources. There's wonderful stuff. There's a ton of stuff that has wisdom about caregiving, uh, the life of children, being a parent, a caregiver. Well, I mean, and this is just a sample of some just suggested resources that you can draw on that are easily at one place. Finally, the notebook suggests uh, some things you can do. The Children's Guide and uh, um, the team could some suggested educational activities quarter by quarter. And I, I you know, I'm not going to read them all off. But we, what we did was drill down and say, let's say, let's say you go home now, you take this, uh, you get the full notebook. It doesn't even say you have to start in September. I'm not even expecting that. <laughs> but if you wanted to start in, in next winter, here's one thing you could do in January that might be helpful, useful, supportive of families and particularly helpful to families, caregivers, and children who are struggling with some kind of special need or issue. There's something that can be done in February, something that can be done in March. Do you have to do all three of those? No. You could wait till spring and maybe do one thing in May if you choose. 
it, there's no assignment here. It's this is a smorgasbord. This is a buffet. This is what we did at lunch today. Not everybody has to take January, February, right? You don't have to put everything on your plate the first year or even the second year. It's just a, you know, here's a set of resources. Maybe there's a teachable timing, opportune moment where one of these suggestions for an activity in the life of the church that's educational might, might make some sense. Uh, and then I... Uh, <clears throat> In the notebook, there are also a set of similar suggestions for how to build commitment over time in the life of the church. Not This is step one, step two, but here are ten steps you could take, and it may be that you want to start with step three or step seven, because that fits your congregation where you are with folks. Here are some suggestions for becoming a children and family, friendly congregation, welcoming congregation, particularly for families who may be a little reluctant to come into the life of the church because they feel, oh, we're not like the rest of the families. Here's some ways that over a period of time we can put out some signs, some things we can do, ways we can begin to make it clear that y'all come and come as you are. Thirdly, some suggestions about some concrete spiritual support groups that you can develop and maybe even some material service and support work that you can do. Uh, Maybe connecting up with some of the other services and resources in the community and then suggestions for advocacy. The church is alone. We're not we can't possibly do it all for children and families. We've got to be part of the wider community. And so the last two pieces in the notebook, the second to the last piece, is just a prompt for you to begin to look at what I call your, your, your social service, mental health, health neighbors in the community. Uh, at St. John's by the gas station, Pastor Craig and Sue, our children's mental health guide, we don't know everybody in the school system, but we did go to the local neighborhood school and find out who the school psychologist was and who the special education teacher was, and we invited them to come by uh, during May uh, and say a word during the service about what they did, and we thanked them. We said, hooray for our neighbors who are working with kids and they were available after coffee hour just to say hello to people. Some of our parents said it was the first time I mean they'd gone to that school their kids had gone to that school it was the first time they ever even knew that there was a school psychologist. <laughs> Health system. As a, is there a pediatrician? Is there a family practice doc? Is there a nurse practitioner? Is there a parish nurse? Is there somebody that I can connect with as a pastor and as our children's family guide? Somebody in the health system that if I have a, have a question or if a family comes up and is wanting, that we could turn to and just say, you know, this is a starting point. Doesn't mean they're going to solve everything. I don't know, I mean, that the health system's all in a scramble anyway. So what I try and do is just try and know some key people that I can turn to and say, this is what's come up on, you know, or, or, or the guide can call and say, boy, we got somebody in the church who's wrestling with this, you know, we, what would you suggest as a next step? Similar with community mental health services or children, youth, and family service agencies, the Y, boys and girls clubs, that sort of thing. And then finally, this is not an easy one, because none of us, none of us will have churches where any kid ends up in the criminal justice system, right? We don't, we don't need, I'm amazed, yeah, um, perfectly fine kids get cattywampus with the law. And I remember the first time I was a pastor, I said, I ended up being the juvenile court chaplain because I was one of the first ministers that actually showed up down there to ask about how can I be helpful to a kid. They said, well, this is what you can do, but we need a chaplain. (laughs) So I I don't want to overburden you, but uh, one piece is to just know what the systems and services are. And then a a final suggestion is uh, that you develop a family a children and family resource list. And if I had more time, I was going to have you all help fill in. Who are, if, if you had 10 phone numbers in your community, in your neighborhood, in your church, that you could call 
uh, in order to get some help for a family, who are the people? You know, specific names, ten names that are in your congregational go-to list for children and families. I think some of those people on that list would be here at the conference too. Mm-hmm. So um, it doesn't always have, have to be people physically there. Right, and that, and that's I mean with the internet, I'm still a dinosaur. I was you know I didn't have TV till I was 12. So, uh, but yeah, with internet, and that's the other thing. There's a there's a, a wide list of internet uh, web based resources, and as we continue to develop uh, our our networking within the UCC, that's one of the things that's ha- happening. We know who we are uh, and where to maybe make some contacts beyond our local areas. I'm going to officially wrap it up there, Steve. Only problem, if we follow this, yeah.